Hey, this is Doc G, and today we have a rewind episode of the Earn and Invest podcast with Pete Adeny, Mr. Money Mustache, and we discuss COVID and one of his notorious tweets. This was in the midst of the worst of the COVID pandemic, and yet a lot of the things we talk about are still relevant today. We talk about masks, we talk about finances, we talk a little bit about everything. I hope you enjoy this episode. It may not be new, but it might be new to you. Hey, this is Pete Aideney, also known as Mr. Money Mustache, and you're listening to the Earn and Invest podcast. Nothing feels better than going viral. When you write something or blog something or podcast something, and it goes around the internet and you're getting high fives all over the place... You feel really good, and yet nothing feels worse than the opposite. When you put something out there, and instead of getting congratulations, you get disagreement and sometimes anger, and it feels like everyone is against what you just said, and you might have even had good intentions, but it happens anyway. Well, that happened to me a few months ago. This is the Earn and Invest podcast, but when it was called What's Up Next, I booked a guest and recorded what I thought was an excellent episode. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but between the months that I had recorded the episode and when it went live, that community member had said and done some things that everyone else was not in agreement with. So there was a lot of anger towards this figure, and I always release a few days before a teaser for my episodes. And when I released this teaser, I put it on my Facebook group page, all I got were comments, and they were full of anger. How could you give this person a voice? How could you be a platform for the things that have been done? And usually I'll get 10 or 20 comments on these type of posts a few hundred comments in, I was a little bit lost because I didn't know exactly what to do. The one side of me said, I truly believe in free speech and I don't like censorship and I know that what's in this episode is great. On the other hand, I also know that what this person happened to do hurt a lot of community members And I don't want to give a platform to people who do destructive things. Eventually, I decided not to air the episode. And my reasoning was this. I had built this podcast around the community that I wanted to reach. I wanted to build this community. And if my community was coming back to me in force and telling me that this guest was not fitting the community we had built, then it behooved me to listen. So I did. But months and months later, I still have trouble with this concept. When someone you believe in and trust, maybe when they talk about personal finance, says something that you don't agree with or even that you find egregious, what do you do? Do you stop following them? Do you untweet them? Do you cancel them? But if you do that, isn't that censorship? What happens then to freedom of speech? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Pete Adeny is the renowned blogger behind Mr. Money Mustache. He is a writer of iconic posts such as the shockingly simple math behind early retirement, a man who I had only heard uniform praise for until a few days ago in response to a single tweet. First of all, Pete, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you. Nice to meet you in video form for the first time, even though we've met in real life in the past. I just wanted to comment. It's kind of funny because I haven't been very universally praised. I've had like the most crazy stuff thrown at me since the beginning in 2011, just because I always write stuff that is not the common, you know, it's like not very mainstream. It's not mainstream to say that you're you're allowed to spend not all your money in the United States. Like that alone is controversial. So people are mad at me all the time. So let's talk a little bit about this tweet that caught me a few days ago and people's response to it, especially our community's response. What was the tweet about and what did people respond to it? 
Well, this tweet, and I've kind of been doing this a little bit since the beginning of the COVID times. I've just been trying to encourage people to focus on things that they can control, as I always do in finance. And I am also like kind of a health blogger too. So I've been frustrated that the stories, especially in like New York Times and MSN stuff, has always been focusing on how scary COVID is and how helpless we are. We should all stay home. And these people are bad because they're not wearing masks. Look at this picture of these people at a pool. They're focusing all this stuff that's anger and divisive and and not really helping anybody, right? And then I've noticed like the shame culture comes out every time I say I'm doing something with my friends. People are like online. They're like, where's your social distancing? You shouldn't be seeing your friends. I think this is a really counterproductive response. So I started responding by putting in things that make a bigger difference in public health than getting or not getting COVID, which is not to diminish the importance of that, but it's just bigger numbers. And so I've been telling people they should be getting more exercise. They should be eating better. should be riding your bike. It saves like, you know, if everybody did this more, we'd save a lot of lives. And even just on a personal level, if you start to improve your personal health and then later you catch the virus or any virus, you're going to have a lot better outcome, you know? So I just focus on that stuff. And then, and, you know, in my comment, I said, you know, here's the things you should be doing, bikes, barbells, and salads, which is like one of my slogans. And then I said, so why are we arguing about who's wearing and not wearing masks? Because I don't think that's what should be the dominating news force, you know, like we can make a bigger difference if we focus on other stuff. So I thought that was the end of it. You know, I thought people were like, oh, there goes Pete. He's just always talking about barbells, bikes, and salads next. But instead, people got really mad at me and they interpret that as an anti-mask stance. And that's unfortunately become a really dumb political F. I can't believe what the people fight about in this country, but you know, at this current time, the liberals versus conservatives have decided to fight about like, are masks a good idea or not? So if you say anything that's not like, wear a mask, then you're suddenly a conservative. So that means you're an enemy of every liberal. And to be honest, it's just such a waste of time, like, which it was kind of just reinforcing what I was trying to speak out against. But I definitely see, you know, I ruffled some feathers and I am sorry about it. You know, I did not want to, to be an anti-mask person and, you know, to get into the politics of it. But I saw from the Twitter responses that that's how it went. So I, I made some responses to some of those people like, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. But you can't be too picky on Twitter. like. You try your best and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And as you were saying, it hurts you when as a blogger or whatever, a producer of content, the people that you're trying to help that you think of as your people, if they don't understand it and they get angry with you, it can, it can hurt your feelings. But at the same time, all you can do is try your best and, and not, not really let the criticism get to you too much. You use it as a question to your heart. But you can't just say, like, I'm going to quit now because some people are mad at me because otherwise nobody would ever speak up for what they actually care about. There's a lot to dive in in your response, but let's start with the easiest and simplest. Just to clear things up, you are not anti-mask. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I became a, a data nerd. Like, that's how I respond to stuff. And I didn't know a lot about viruses. So I've been reading, like, all the, the detailed stuff. So I look at charts and numbers and, and scientific stuff. And I definitely believe that masks are a quick and easy way to reduce virus transmission, definitely of COVID, but lots of other airborne viruses. And that was cool. That's stuff I didn't know. I learned that back in March when it was first becoming well known. I want to talk a little bit more in a moment about some of the criticisms that came in the response to that tweet. But before I do, did this response surprise you? Did it seem a little bit more aggressive or different than the responses you've got in the past? It surprised me a little bit because I've made some missteps in these Corona times before, which were misinterpreted as being, you know, like conservative virus denier kind of stuff. So I try to make stuff more universally well understood and try to be clear about stuff. So a little bit of a surprise, but at the same time, like it's pretty much 100% of anything I write is going to get criticism. And so I see angry people all the time, Facebook, Twitter, no matter what you do, you're going to get criticized. So I try to learn to not take it personally and I read things. And then I think, I just look if the criticism, if I can learn something from it. Like if it's somebody that I respect and who is doing it peacefully and honestly, like, hey, Pete, just so you know, this could be misinterpreted in this way. 
or if somebody that, you know, like if Bill Gates is like, I mean, not like this would happen, but just as I use this as a funny <laughs> example, like, Pete, I've been reading Mr. Money Mustache and you're really doing the opposite of what you think. Like you're trying to reduce material, you know, resource, natural resource consumption in the rich world. But here's some data that makes me think you're doing the opposite. I'd be like, shit, because that's somebody who really thinks about his his actions and he understands a lot of big factors in the world. And if I'm counterproductive in Bill Gates's opinion, I would be really taking it seriously and I would I'd be willing to change my approach or shut the whole block down if I, you know, if I believed what he was saying. But if someone's just saying like, you're an asshole, like that doesn't, that doesn't, that's not a very good argument. So it's not very convincing. Did you find that the criticism came from a different group of people this time around? It seemed like there were a lot of general personal finance community supporters who were lending voice to some of the criticisms. Did this feel different from that standpoint that was criticism coming from different people or not really? I might not have read all of this stuff recently. I tried, uh, I looked at Twitter for a while that day, and then I, I only log in about once a week. So there might be some surprises waiting for me <laughs> when I get back. But there was one guy, like uh, I think his account name is Freedom33, and he was really nice about it. He was like, you know, I've been following you for a while, and I'm, I must say you're disappointing me with your stance here. So that was really good criticism. Like that's the kind that makes me really think. So we wrote back a few times, back and forth a few times, and then it seemed like he understood my point later. But that's still a really good, you know, that's not how Twitter should work. Like I shouldn't, you're trying to make something that people understand the first time. If they have to dig into the comments to understand what the writer meant in the first place, that means I've made a mistake, which means I'm not using Twitter very well. Because, I mean, the only reason I use Twitter it's not to like entertain myself or get prestige or anything. It's to try to get certain messages across to people in an easy to digest way. So if I put out some message that doesn't do what I hoped it would do, then to me, that's a failure because I'm not helping anybody. Let's talk about some of those specific criticisms. You brought up the fact that you've been getting into data lately. One of the common criticisms I saw was people saying, you know what, Pete, you're getting out of your lane, right? You're in personal finance. Why are you commenting about health? Uh, yeah. What do you say to something like that? I would disagree with that. So my lane is complex systems and numbers. And it always has been since I was a little kid. Like finance is just like one of the smallest thing that I'm interested in. I just happened to write a blog about it, but I'm, I'm just a normal curious engineer person. So like I build houses and I design structures and I am interested in, you know, music and other subjects. So I, I really happen to be interested in statistics, right? Statistics are really my jam since I was a little kid. And to me, COVID is really a pure statistics problem. Like it's all about multiplying factors and then how dangerous is the disease compared to other known risks. And I've been kind of fascinated by actuarial science, you know, like lifespans of people and what are the different right uh, risk factors. And I've written other articles about that. Like one of them is called safety is an expensive illusion. And I was trying to convince people that we are worrying about the wrong things. So when as COVID has come out, and then I read about things like infection fatality rate and the different levels of cases versus fatalities in different countries, and then comparing this to the background death rate, that's like, that really is the stuff that I am most passionate about. And I use that to make my financial decisions. And I use that when I, when I'm writing these blog articles about money at an underlying level, they're based on statistics. And I just saw when, as the world's response happened, and then uh, especially American media response to COVID, I saw something very much lacking. Like for example, New York times is really fond of saying like, an unimaginable toll. COVID deaths reach 135,000. Like that's more than 69 11s and stuff. Like they're comparing it to the wrong thing. And I think that's irresponsible or at least negligent, like, you know, ignorant reporting if they don't know. Like, okay, so if you're talking about public health, you have to talk about the context. Like, look it up. Like every year there are 2.8 million deaths in the US, which is 8,000 per day, roughly. So anytime you talk about the deaths of anything, not just COVID, but whether it's nuclear power plants or smoking or car crashes, you have to always say as a percentage of normal deaths, because otherwise your readers who are probably not scientists themselves, they're just going to see that number. And like, yeah, 130,000 people sounds like a big number. 
But in the time of since COVID started killing people in the United States, one million people have died from natural causes, right? So it's it's definitely a big deal, but you need to dig into the details to know how big a deal it is and who are the people that are dying. And those are all the things that I think we should just be reporting in order to, otherwise you're just scaring people and people can't make good decisions when they're scared. So that's why I've been frustrated with New York Times type COVID coverage. And I think I see that creeping into the way that the people on Twitter, you know, like if anyone's not into actuarial science and they just read the New York Times, then they're doing their part to be a good citizen. But what they what they're doing is like, let's be as vigilant as possible about like staying home and not seeing our friends and wearing masks. And they're doing that because it's their heart is pure and good, right? But they're doing it without even understanding what you know, they're not getting the actual information. So then they're not making good decisions and not sharing good decisions. So it just frustrates me because I'm a numbers guy and I think everything should be explained with some numbers. It's interesting that you say that. And I can almost see why that could be off-putting because statistics are one side of the story. And a lot of people come at this problem much more from a behavioral, even somewhat emotional side. So They Mm -hmm. may say, for instance, yes, statistically, heart disease is something that causes more deaths, but there are billions of dollars spent on heart disease and meds, and heart diseases are things that happen that you can't control if heart disease happens in someone else. On the other hand, COVID is an infectious disease that we can spread from person to person. Your own personal behavior can have a great effect on our community well-being. Yeah. And so sometimes when they see that sole mathematical look, they have trouble connecting to it. Yeah, you're right. And that's really my failing is I think about stuff all in terms of math and probability fields. Like, for example, if you're going to drive a car, you are definitely harming everybody else in the world in, from pollution. And then you're definitely harming everybody in your town from the chance of like either scaring them or making noise that disturbs them or crashing into them, you know, but it's not very likely. So we choose to make that driving decision periodically when our own needs are worth basically being an asshole to everybody else, a small amount of asshole, right? Cause it's a small probability. Yeah. That's how it is with, with viruses too. Like, so then you move on to the flu. Every time you like for every season, you always may be carrying an infectious disease, like most likely a flu type virus and you can always spread that to people. So you have to decide when to wear a mask or when to stay at home. And then COVID has now raised the stakes on that. Like it's a more dis- dangerous disease by the flu, but it's, it's about three to five times more dangerous. So if you go out, like if you would normally have a party with, let's say 30 people, and then you scale that down to to 10 people and you've actually like mathed out the risk to be roughly as cruel as you were being by having a party with, with this large, you know, like it's, it's probability. So it's not a yes and no thing. It's not like you're an asshole. If you stand on your deck without a mask and you're a saint, if you stand on your deck with a mask, it's like a big spectrum, you know, and at the very worst would be let's hold a mass of political rally in a small stadium where everybody is not wearing masks and they're yelling, right? Like a Trump rally, like they just did. That would be a much bigger spreading event than you choosing to have your best friends over for a backyard barbecue. But people were treating these things as if they're all the same, which they're not. So I don't know. I think one of the main reasons it's become emotional, because like you're saying, there's tons of shades of gray. Yeah. But one easy way to differentiate is, People can do the kind of yes or no, one or zero based on whether you wear a mask. Yeah. So in if you're looking to stereotype a large population, it's very easy to say people who don't wear masks are in the wrong and people who do wear masks are in the right. And mm-hmm. because it's such a simple variable, I think it's really become a hot discussion point. And I think tempers do rise because it's very easy to see a picture of someone walking in the middle of the street without a mask on, surrounded by masked people, and think that person is the person in the wrong. 
Yeah, but that's an outdoor setting too. Like that's uh, outdoor transmission is way less of a big deal than indoor. So, and this is the kind of stuff that I I try to encourage my readers to to think about is like think about the numbers instead of thinking in black and white. So, if I'm a school teacher and I insist on not wearing a mask and all my students want to be not exposed to the virus, you know, and I'm in a classroom, that is a big imposition. Whereas if I'm a solo bicyclist on an empty bike path and I choose not to wear a mask, that's completely different. And I want people to think about everything as, you know, as shades of gray and not be judgmental. And even if somebody is being inconsiderate, chances are it's not a huge deal of inconsiderate. Like people are, a, we are a selfish creature in general, human beings. So just got to accept that and you can choose your friends who are more considerate, right? Without actually making newspaper stories about people who you think are inconsiderate. There was another line of criticism that's definitely adjacent to this that looks from a different angle. And it's this idea of ableism. I saw this brought up or even privilege. So this idea of ableism is that it's easy for a healthy middle-aged male to say, bike, eat healthy, take care of yourself, lift barbells, but that's really not possible for everybody. There's tons of people Mm -hmm. who are disabled from the, you know, physically able standpoint. And then there are tons of people who financially can't afford bikes or can't afford barbells or. Well, that part is silly because bikes are cheaper than cars and most people drive cars. So, but there is the argument that there are financial circumstances which make some of that more difficult or even eating healthy, right? If you grew up in a poor neighborhood that's a food desert and there's not a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables available, these are things that, you know, we have some privileges in life. What do you think about that criticism? I mean, is it a valid criticism to say that maybe that text or that tweet was a little bit insensitive because it didn't take into consideration people who didn't have the abilities that you or I have Mm -hmm. on a regular daily basis? Yeah. So in a way, yes, it's insensitive, but that's, it's kind of a choice because you only have people's attention for a short amount of time, right? So just like in my earlier little speech about statistics, I'm writing out to a statistical sample. Like I'm not writing to you in particular. I'm writing to who I think is going to read the tweet or the blog post. And most people are able-bodied enough to have choices about transportation. And most of my audience is, to be honest, like fairly high income, well-employed. It's like tech workers. A lot of tech workers read the blog a lot of teachers, doctors, attorneys and stuff, and then also lots of other types of people. So with this limited amount of people's attention I have, like I'm just trying to send out a message that will create the most behavior change that I can and and focus on one thing. So my thing is reduce the natural resource consumption of the world in in the fastest way I can. And to me, I think that's rich people. So I target the economic behaviors of wealthy people And I choose to, like, there's other stuff, you know, there's like racial unfairness and there's like income inequality, which is sort of the stuff you mentioned. Those are separate problems. And I acknowledge that they're real, but they're not my area of specialty. So I don't want to dilute my main message, which is, hey, rich people spend less with like, okay, but also if you're mobility impaired, you should do this. And then if you can't afford a bike, you could do this other thing. Like those are valuable messages too, but like A, those are things I'm not very skilled in understanding and B, I think it would be, my time would be less well used addressing the niche cases because the big piece of pie is so big already and I'm just one guy. So I'm trying to do like a big project with very limited resources. So I'm just kind of focus on it. In other words, you are speaking to your avatar. So for you, your crowd, the people who you generally interact with, with your blog, who are consuming your content this tweet made a lot of sense for them. Well, I mean, maybe not that tweet, hopefully, but in general, like the stuff that I write, like 500 blog articles and all these tweets and stuff, that's the general purpose. So like, I'm very, I'm trying to be pragmatic. And in a way that can, if you're thinking of me as like talking to you personally, and you're not the person I actually wrote it for, the type of person, then it'll seem insensitive. 
And of course, that'll make you think, you know, if you don't understand how the internet works or how what I'm trying to do, it'll seem like I'm an asshole, right? Like, how dare he talk to me when I'm in a wheelchair and he's talking about biking? Like, that's he's an asshole, but that's not that at all. Like, I super am not trying to ability shame or any other type of shame people. I'm just trying to create change in a large demographic of people that happen to be interested in my message. So for me, tech workers and people who think somewhat analytically and people who have reasonably high incomes, they find the strategies, like some of the stuff that I, they find it useful. So they follow it. And then to me, that's really great because I get a lot more people moving close to work and driving less and biking more. And our cities are getting to be friendlier places. And, you know, another thing that's important to me, like fatherhood, I get so many emails from young men who have just had children and they're like, I'm going to devote most of my time to raising kids because I've set aside my super high powered career. And now I'm an equal parent or like I'm doing even more than half of the parenting. And that is why I do this stuff. Like we're creating change among the few, you know, certain population that happens to be willing to listen to me. So it's, I can only do so much. There was one last criticism I thought was interesting and I'm wondering your thoughts about it. There was a thread that said something to the extent of, well, Pete believes in the low information diet. So he's not really aware of what's going on in our world right now. So it's no surprise that he would tweet something like this. <laughs> That's normally true. <laughs> I certainly like a low information diet. But when it comes to COVID and this particular you know, pandemic and world health situation, it's, it's like the opposite. I have, I've read too much and I, I'm torn on whether I wish I had done that or not. But I guess it was because it was something that came up that I didn't understand and I needed to understand it. So I dug into the data and, you know, when it comes down to it, like I think that the disease is, A, it's like a lot less dangerous, like infection fatality rate wise than most people think. If you just took a poll of people, what are your chances of being hospitalized or dying and like what's the average age of death? But even more important is I think it's a disease that we are the only way to beat it is either a herd immunity or a vaccine. And there's a lot of signs of herd immunity already forming in places like New York and Italy and Spain and at a a lower infection rate than we thought with less death rate than we thought. So I think the responsible path, this is going to sound crazy for people who haven't dug into this stuff, but I think the younger and healthier people and kids should basically be exposed to low doses of it, build up the immunity while we super protect the people that we that need it. And then those people become the herd and they become a blocking force a lot more quickly than we get a vaccine. And I think that would lead to less deaths in older people. And I also think it would lead to less disruption in terms of like wrecking our society too much from being afraid of everything. Because if we're, if we're all going to wait inside our apartments until there's a vaccine and that vaccine is widely distributed, not just in our country, but in the whole world, because we also want to reopen our borders, that's a really, really long time. Like even with the vaccines coming so fast right now, it's still, I think, a, a really poor strategic choice. So yeah, my ideology is I think every time there's a coronavirus case and someone recovers, that's good news because that's another Im- vaccinated person. And the news stories are like, reporting every coronavirus case as if it's a bad thing. I think the only thing that's bad is when people are really sick and they suffer or end up in the hospital. And of course, when they die, those are the only thing that's bad. Every recovery that's not painful for the person is like great news for society. So I don't want this to turn into a big COVID argument. I actually do not agree with that at all for a number of reasons. And it could take a whole podcast in itself to go through that. There's a lot of studies suggesting, for instance, that we might not ever reach herd immunity or that immunity might be short-lived. And there's also a lot of evidence that we may be able to get to herd immunity in better ways with less death if we're smarter about it. So the masks definitely yeah, lower exactly. the threshold to reach and, herd immunity. And death rates, unfortunately, could very well start rising quite a bit over the next few weeks because we know that there's a huge lag time between cases, hospitalization, and then deaths. But yeah, it's well, not the, known as part of the problem. Because our uh, most of our country has not gone through the infection. So the theory for the herd immunity crowd is that 
only when you reach a level of like New York City's type of exposure, then you would end up with, if you're lucky, herd immunity effects. But most of the US is only like one fifth of the way there or something, right? Yeah. So until that happens, you have to have deaths and, you know, and in the, the peak, the debate is like, how much of the people, how many of the people have to die? And it's, it's going to be like the oldest people, mostly before you reach that. And then is that an acceptable level or not? And so those are the things like, like I read a lot of things that say what you just said. And then I read the other side of it and, you know, try to make a decision on which seems more credible. But if people are going to argue about this stuff, it's really, you don't have to be mad at the person. You can just say like, have you seen this? Here's a paper I want you to read. And if you value that person's opinion, then you say, please report back to me with what you think about this paper. And then, you know, I would write back to you and I'd be like, yeah, what do you think? And then, and you'd say, well, I disagree for these reasons because of the following numbers. And then that way, nobody has to be an asshole. Nobody is insensitive. We're just talking about numbers and facts and like, do you think this is a good trade off for society or not? That's a perfect segue into talking about some of these bigger picture issues about what happens when we disagree as a community and certainly on social media. I've heard lots of opinions on your tweet. And if I was to roughly and very generically break them into two groups, one group is unhappy and feels that it was insensitive and is unhappy you put it out there. The other group may or may not agree with you, but what they're really worried about is this idea that people will use that tweet to either try to cancel you or censor you, or that in general, in our community, we're taking these little bits of information from the internet and using it to cancel people out and censor them. Do you worry yeah. about these things when you put something out there? Like, does it feel like our community has changed and it's a little bit more aggressive and threatening to, for us to put out our opinions? Well, I've seen that a little bit, especially on Twitter it happens. And I really disagree with that behavior, I think. But I, don't, I can't really try to control it. Like if somebody wants to be, you know, like a Twitter police and like, oh, you've said something that's not in line with the, the proper way of saying things, you know, I'm going to unfollow you, then that's fine. Like, I don't feel any, I, I don't want that type of person following me anyway. But I do want to remain like, I want people to have to think my advice is useful, because I'm trying to make a difference with it. So if I'm offending people so much that they are not going to listen to to what I'm trying to get across, I'm going to try to express things differently. But when it comes to real disagreements like that I'm going to participate in, I've learned, you know, over the last 10 years of getting older, the only real way to disagree with somebody is by asking a question. So, and it has to be a really honest, non-judgmental, non-angry question, and you have to be wanting to hear the answer. So, you know, if I respect your opinion and you put something that I don't understand, I don't, I think is wrong on Twitter or, or your blog. And if I want to change your mind or at least learn why you think that, I'll say, hey, Doc G, have you seen this other paper by Michael Levitt? And, and it really seems to disagree with what you said about herd immunity or whatever. How, how do you explain or what's your opinion on the difference between these two things? And that way, you have a chance to respond. And I'm not compromising our friendship by insulting you. I'm just saying I, I've seen this and it's different from what you're saying. So how do you resolve the difference? Because if we're friends... And if anything that's worth talking about with another person, you want to hear their opinion. And if you don't want to hear their opinion, then tune out and don't bother listening in the first place. But, you know, there's no need to ever throw insults at somebody. And I'm really, really strict about that. And I always have like in my blog, in the comment section, like if somebody responds angrily to somebody else, the comment just gets deleted because that's not how you do social discourse on in my forum. It has to be you're answering a question, asking a question. And you're trying to agree or disagree on data. There's no interpersonal, I'm mad at you stuff because no, the world is already a mean enough place you know, without us getting mad at each other. In my intro, I mentioned that blog post, the shockingly simple math behind early retirement. That was 2012. So you've been in this personal finance, financial independence, retire early 
community for a long time. In fact, I would say that it's mostly grown up right there with you and around you. Do you think things are changing in our community? Are we less open to listening to each other's opinions? I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention to that aspect before or now. And, you know, if you tune into news type stuff or arguments, that's what you're going to see. You're focusing on arguments. In my real life, I certainly see a harmonious and cooperative world and there, and more and more people keep coming into it through our co-working space, you know. So I see a great, wonderful cooperative spot. And, you know, for example, the co-working space has its own Slack group, which is just a discussion board for people who don't use the Slack tool. And we have a, a channel that's called Corona Chat. And we post stuff back and forth and comment it like somebody will share a news article and then another person will comment on it and then you will disagree with each other. But there's been zero anger in that whole thing. We started in March back when coronavirus started being a news story. And there's quite a few people participating and it's all been agreeable. So I think it's a good way to run your own life. And it's certainly a good way for public discourse to happen. And I would like to see more encouragement of that. But uh, it's really not my specialty, like how do we fix it? Like, is there a way to make Twitter more civil or the comments on like CNN.com news stories or Fox News? That's like that is something that is out of my lane to use your earlier thing. I don't really know much about big crowd social dynamics and tribes and fighting and stuff. So to me, it's a mystery. You know, maybe I can learn more about that if someone recommends a book a few books to learn about how to handle these things. For me, I just kind of run away from it. You know, like I don't like conflict and I don't create conflict. And I could probably be a little tougher at dealing with conflict of people. I tend to just shut them out of my life, but I'm certainly trying not to create it online. One of the problems with Twitter, certainly, and even some of the other platforms is it's really hard to have an open, clear conversation in such small bites without hearing someone's voice or without seeing someone's face. So there are going to be many people listening to this who read your tweet. Some of them will be those people who really found fault with it. This is a better chance for you to talk to them directly. What would you say to them about this tweet? Is there anything that you think you couldn't convey there. And of course, that's what this whole conversation has been about. But yeah. any last words you would say to them and say, look, this is kind of what I meant, which maybe couldn't be conveyed in that tweet. Yeah, I think we certainly have covered it really well with you know the, all this deep explanation and stuff. But the final word be, I still love you. Like, I'm only writing these things because I'm your bossy older brother. I'm trying to help. And I'm trying to use my weird perspective of the world and i know it's it can be hard to deal with because like i'm a numbers person i'm a little bit of a robot but that's the same reason why money worked for me and that's the same reason i explained money i tried to explain my different perspective in money and and how it can get you to early retirement it's just because i see things differently and i th see things in terms of the numbers and then i'm trying to take this this side and then explain it to the real world in like actionable advice. So my tweet is just saying public health and personal health are really the same thing. And like 75% of our medical spending or something like that is on these diseases that are influenced by our lifestyle. And that should be like, if the New York Times is trying to help people, they should be finding ways to make it so we are all like a much larger percentage of us are healthy. And so that there is no obesity epidemic and there is no diabetic, you know, like everybody who reads the New York Times should understand that drinking, for example, a can of soda is like smoking a crack pipe. Like it's super, super bad for you. Not exactly the same degree, but it's like unacceptable. And like making cookies and giving dessert to your family is killing them. Like sugar is the devil. Like this is just one of many public health messages. messages I would love to have more popular so New York Times has managed to like get this brand new concept that wearing a mask is caring. Wearing is caring. So good, but that's only like a temporary help for right now. If they could get these messages that are much bigger effect and like cars wreck cities, you know, that would change public health so much and it would save trillions and trillions of dollars 
in what we spend our money on in this country, but they're not pushing that message. So I think we should push these messages that do make bigger changes. And that's all I was trying to do with that tweet is like, let's get healthy because that's, that basically fixes a lot of life problems, including today's problem. Well, Pete, I wanted to thank you for coming on today and discussing something that's difficult, which is disagreement. And no one loves conflict, or at least a lot of us don't. And dealing with it and trying to make yourself understood while still delivering a message can be difficult. So thank you for coming on and talking with us today. Before we say goodbye, are there any projects you want to tell us about? Anything in your future interesting happening? Oh, it's just the usual stuff. I'm keeping things light and being a dad mostly around here, which is why I've not been writing on the blog much. So yeah, just I hope I can be back into doing more writing in the in the future. And hopefully I'll, I can re- recover from the great pain of this Twitter blunder and get, get back on my feet. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I wanted to thank Pete Adeny. That's a wrap. All right, cool. In the first half of the show, Mr. Money Mustache talked about his controversial tweet. After the break, we talked to Jim White about GR arbitrage gone bad. Well, sort of. But first, want to learn how to manage your money better in less time today? Jim Wang created WalletHacks.com to help demystify money. For far too long, experts have made it complicated so they can make money off you. WalletHacks.com offers no products, no services, just information to help you become better with your money. And best of all... It's free. Check it out today at WalletHacks.com. That's W-A-L-L-E-T-H-A-C-K-S dot com. And be sure to sign up for their free newsletter. And now, back to the show. So we're here with Jim from Route to Retire. As you guys may remember, on the Route to Retire blog, he has been writing for years about financial independence, retiring early, and the particular flavor that he talks about often is geo-arbitrage. So Jim was smart. He made a financial independence plan that didn't rely on geo-arbitrage, but as we walked through the years with him, we saw that he made out a plan to go live in Panama, and it was really cool to see him retire and move to Panama. And so, Jim, I'm surprised to be saying this, but happy to have you on the call. Welcome back to the United Hi. States. Hey, Doc. Thanks for the uh, great intro. Appreciate it. Now, you are in the U.S. right now. Is that correct? Yes. We recently came back to Ohio Uh not knowing if we're going to have the opportunity to go back anytime soon because the borders are currently closed in Panama. So this was a planned return to the U.S., but made complicated by the fact that because of the coronavirus pandemic, you may not be able to return to your quote-unquote geo-arbitrage life and go back to life as normal. (laughs) Yeah, life's pretty interesting right now. Initially, we were planning to go back... uh, I believe it was in June, and then once the whole pandemic hit, then things changed. We uh, we had to make a decision whether it was to stay or to go, and we did decide to stay uh, in Panama for the time being. That was in March. We just kept riding it out, and they just kept canceling uh, the airports from being reopened, and we finally made a decision to come back for now. And that was not a light decision to stay in March, was it? No, that was that was probably one of the hardest decisions we've ever had. There was uh, my wife and I talking, arguing. There was crying, but you know that was just me. No, uh, it was really hard to decide what to do because we were in a great area called Boquete, Panama, and it's a small town. And the problem is, well, it's not a problem, but they don't have active cases in the entire country of Panama. You know had a minuscule amount of cases compared to the U.S. So deciding to, to leave from such an, an area where there was, I don't want to say no problems, but there, there wasn't as big of a deal as it is here in the U.S. to come here was hard. But on the flip side, we didn't know if we would be trapped there. And but when I say trapped there, away from family and friends and not being able to come back at some point. You know, there's, there's just so many unknowns right now that it's, uh, it, it made for a very difficult decision. 
And it sounds like in Boquete and maybe in Panama in general, they were really strict. I mean, you were locked down. You guys weren't leaving your apartment for a while. When they finally did let you leave the apartment, only certain number of family members could leave at the same time. It sounds a lot worse than things were here in the U.S. from that standpoint. You you have been paying attention. <laughs> Thanks for reading my blog. Uh, no, the... Yes, the president has been very aggressive there since the beginning. And, you know, in my opinion, I think it's been fantastic. I think it's really reflected on the results that they're having there. You know, Panama City itself is more like a Miami, and that's, uh, that's been kind of messy. But, but the other areas uh, are, are pretty clean. I mean, the, the province that we were in, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they're pretty low when we were there. And in our city where we were at, there's no active cases. And so what happened was, uh, yes, we were on lockdown for a long time. We had months where we couldn't go out and we would alternate between one, like men were allowed out on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, no, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and women on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And Sundays was, you can't go out at all. And when you were allowed out on your days, you were only allowed out for two hours at a time. And that was only to go to the bank, grocery store, or pharmacy. That's basically it. Rough. (laughs) Now, it's notable that you guys are not citizens of Panama. So you were required to leave the country every certain number of months. As the pandemic hit, did they give you leniency? Like, did they say to you, okay, you're supposed to leave the country we're in the midst of this pandemic, the airports are shut down. Were they telling you you could stay for longer periods without leaving? So yeah, as, as tourists, it's, uh, it's a little different there. And that was one of our concerns. But we were lucky because they had our time that we were allowed to be there until technically was late June would have been our six months where our, they don't do tourist visas, but basically your, your six months of time would have ended at, at that time for us. So that was, that was okay. Cause that bought us a little time to figure things out. But in the midst of this, maybe around April or something, they said, okay, we're going to extend people in your situation by another two weeks. And they've kind of made some changes, but recently they said, okay, you have until everybody you're, you're good until the end of October. And if you're still here after October, get out. But, uh, that made life a little less stressful because they at least covered that ground for us. Let's say they had come to you and said, the pandemic is going on. We are completely fine with you staying here as long as you need to. Do you think you still would have come home? <laughs> uh, me or me with the family? <laughs> Both. We, we, had, uh, we had different angles on this. Uh, you know, I, my biggest problem, Doc, and, and this is good and bad, is when I make decisions, I, 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 think, I think from the head. I, like I'm, I'm very logical. I try to process everything and think only that way. Whereas uh, my wife, Lisa, she's, she thinks with the heart. And that's not a bad thing. It's good that we're together because we kind of balance each other out on things. But uh, that's what made it very difficult to decide. I think, and I had written a a post on that uh, before called, this is a horrible idea. We're doing it anyway. And it basically listed, Hey, here's all the, here's all the reasons why we should be staying right where we're at, but we're still going to come back to the U S anyway. And that's what we did. So was it fear about the pandemic and traveling, or was there also a portion about missing home and not being amongst the people you love? I think it was only, I don't want to say only family and friends, but in my opinion, that's, that's what it is. I think uh, Lisa kind of had a, a fear of being trapped there that, hey, if things get worse, you know, we can't get the same type of medical as we can in the U.S., which the quality is, is very good in Panama, but they don't have as many beds. They don't have this and that. So it's one of those, if this becomes overwhelming in Panama, are we going to be up a creek, so to speak. So that was part of it. But family was the the biggest reason, you know, I think what's important to realize is, you know, we were trapped inside and we have a, our daughter's now 10. Uh, but she, she was not allowed out at all, like at all for since, since the beginning of March, she had to stay 
in our our, our little uh, three bedroom condo for uh, for for everything. And she's a good kid, and she had fun, and she was creative, and came up with things. But think about being with your parents twenty four hours a day, no friends, no anything. That was really tough for her. And we had our good times. I think I think over the past month, I think we wanted to strangle each other sometimes, but. <laughs> Uh, but with us all being together in that, it, it gave you just a lot of time to think. We weren't doing the fun things we normally did. We weren't hiking. We weren't out walking around and, and doing fun stuff. So all we were doing was thinking about what if, should we, should we come back? Should we not come back? And that, and that made it very difficult. And aside to this conversation, but what I love about your story is that you guys were not depending on geo arbitrage for your financial future. So while you had looked at that in your calculations, you had also done separate calculations about what you would need if you decided you needed to come back to the U.S. Now, I don't think anyone foresaw this pandemic, but certainly you (laughs) foresaw the possibility of something going wrong, which speaks a lot to the impressiveness of your planning. Let's pivot a little bit to this trip you took home. Traveling in a time of COVID is different. Traveling internationally is even more complicated. And the airport wasn't really open when you guys had to come home. Tell me about what it took, the logistics behind returning to the U.S. This, this made it even more of a, a difficult endeavor because normally there's, there is an airport about 45 minutes from, uh, from Boquete in a city called David. And normally you would take that and it would take a little puddle jumper and it'll take you over to Panama City. Panama City is like, they call it the, the hub of the Americas, that everything going in and out of Central America goes through Panama City. So basically we take a little puddle jumper over to that and then Panama city back to Ohio and we call it a day. That's normal. But in our case with uh, everything being shut down, the borders being shut down, the airports being shut down, we had to drive across the country to get to Panama city. That was an eight hour drive in a, a van with other people, a couple of which wore masks and a couple of which did not wear masks. And that, uh, that did bother me quite a bit, but you know, it is what it is. But we we took our eight hour drive across the country. So by the time we our flight was actually going to be at three o'clock in the morning, which was kind of weird in itself. But it was a humanitarian flight and it would be the only flight at the airport. Everything else is closed down. Um, But when we got there from the van that we took, we needed to stay at a hotel first until, you know, we got we got in about two or three in the afternoon. We had to wait then until midnight to go to the airport and the airport was empty. I've never seen anything so weird like that. It literally reminded me of Miami airport, but just picture empty, like all the halls, empty, everything. So, but that was all fine. We, we did that. We went through, they did uh, the thermal temperature scans. I didn't know they were taking temperatures that way, but that, that worked out well. And then we just waited got on our flight. They had it packed. You'd think the middle seats would be open. Not so much. And it wasn't a commercial flight, was it? It was. It was actually on uh, Copa. We know, one of the things, Doc, I'll tell you this, it, it, it bothers the heck out of me that they call these humanitarian flights. And the cost of these flights, you know, the three big ones were Spirit, uh, United, and Copa. It seemed to be the ones offering most of these flights. And I think they do it just for the, the, the marketing of, hey, this is humanitarian. We're doing a good thing. But if you'd see the outrageous prices that they charge for tickets, I mean, it's it's crazy. I know one of them right now is charging to get out of there $700 a seat. That's one way, and it's not even taking you to your destination. So to me, that pulls a little bit of that humanitarian effort out of the whole mix. But, uh, but anyway, we took the flight, took us to uh, Miami. Got in Miami about 7.15 in the morning. And because all the airlines are, they're they're not flying right now. Most of the airlines are down like 70%. I've heard up to 95% of flights have been cut. Finding a flight then from Miami to Cleveland or Akron Canton where we went into was was a lot harder. There there just wasn't a lot to choose from. So our flight was at four o'clock in the afternoon. So we were there from 7.15 in the morning then until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Tons of fun there. And that flight that we took had a layover in Charlotte, 
and then from Charlotte to Akron. And then Akron, we had to stay at a hotel that night. We got in late at night. In other words, it was about a day and a half worth of travel, and it was exhausting. I was about to say, that sounds positively exhausting. I read your blog post. It looks like you barely slept and barely ate throughout most of it. I, I had a lot of anxiety throughout the whole thing. So, yeah, I didn't really sleep until we got to that last hotel, and then I was out like a light. I slept for 10 hours. It is great to have you back in the U.S. I'm glad you guys got here safely. Are you now self-quarantining for a period of time? Yes, we're staying at uh, at uh, my in-laws' house, and we are. I'm in their basement now, recording live from the in-laws' basement. <laughs> so we're gonna wait it out here. You know, we tried to get a test, but uh, apparently that's still not as easy to do as we anticipated. So we're just gonna wait out our 14 days, and and we'll we'll go play from there, and hope we'll be able to get back to the country in the in the future here sooner than later. Well, let's talk about the future a little bit. If your plans to get back to Panama are stifled by this idea of lots of countries not allowing U.S. citizens to come back because of the risk of COVID, how, how do you see the next six months, year playing out? What will you do? Where will you live? Six months. Six months living in the basement. That would be, uh, <laughs> well, hey, that'd be good for the uh, the wallet, but uh, probably not good for anybody living here. Um, but no, I, I think that would be, We'd make a decision as we went here. I mean, the goal is to go back in August, which, you know, as of now is about a month and a half away is kind of what we're hoping for. But uh, but we'll see how that plays out. If it does, once they make an announcement, that's been the hard thing with Panama is they haven't made concrete answers. You know, there, there's nothing, no dates out there. And that's been, been the struggle for us. But once we kind of have a better idea when we'll be allowed we'll make our plans and maybe that'll be, if it's going to be long-term, we'll get an apartment somewhere here. If it's going to be a few months, maybe we'll get the car and travel across the country and just kind of enjoy things a little bit. You know, I mean, you know, that's one of the beauties of early retirement is the flexibility that we have. Um, But the unknown isn't hurting us as bad as I guess it it could be others in the same position. Hashtag van life. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> yes. So looking back, the decision to do arbitrage to move to Panama, any regrets in the July 2020 lens that you're looking at the world from today? What are the chances that the pandemic hits on the, the year we decide to move to a foreign country? <laughs> the odds are slim, but uh, no regrets. We, we loved it there. You know, we have decided to renew our lease there for another year. We would, you know, we, we got kind of ripped off a little bit. We want to do at least another year and just kind of see how it goes. And then there's a good chance we'll end up back in the U S somewhere. The blog is route to retire. I believe what is that route to retire.com. You got it, Zach. Jim, thank you for being on the show again. Hearing your story has been amazing. We've been following you for years as you made that transition from employee to financial freedom in Panama and now back again to the U.S. And we will be riveted to see what happens next. (laughs) Riveted. Love it. Thanks for having me, Doc. Appreciate it.